Dear kind and gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we praise your holy name. For you, Lord, are greatly to be praised, Lord, for all your wondrous works. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come here to worship the Sabbath morning. We thank you for waking us this morning in our right mind to come to church, to have an audience with our God. Lord, we ask that you allow your holy presence, Lord, to officiate this meeting today. Speak to, through your servant, removing me out of your way, and help me, Lord, to bring glory to your name through your word. Father, forgive us of our sins and help us to overcome them. And Lord, we ask a special blessing for those that are on their way here to our meeting, that you will provide safe transport for them. And it, as it was said earlier in our meeting today, Lord, we pray for our church at large and for our brethren, Lord, that they too would also hear these present truth message. This is for our time. Lord, we thank you for all the light that you are shedding. Thank you for all your blessings. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. We've been studying the uh, everlasting gospel. And last week, the lesson was over what it is and its power. This lesson, if you turn to page nine in our lesson book, we are continuing in lesson number three. Lesson number three, January 18, 1896. I don't know if you notice, but we're kind of a, a week ahead than it was during 18. 96, we're just one week ahead in the same time period, January. The everlasting gospel, its power, its object, its effect, and its duration. That's what we're studying today. The first part of the lesson will be a review, a review of what we studied last week. And if you notice, review questions at the head of our lesson book. Before I get into that, I want to do uh, a little precursor before we really get into our lesson. Just go over some quotes. And I have a handout for you that are here. And if I can get some help. I hope the font is not too small. You may have to use your glasses. Below the red section, there's a blue section, and that's where we will start. This is a quote from Acts of the Apostles. The book of Acts was written by the beloved physician Luke, a Gentile convert for the whole church, Jews and Gentiles alike. While it covers a period of a little more than three decades, it is filled with important lessons for the church in every age. In the book of Acts, God clearly indicates that the Christian today shall experience the, uh, shall experience the presence of the same spirit 
who came with power at Pentecost and fanned the gospel message into a flame. Acts of the Holy Spirit through Peter, Paul, John, and James, and others can be repeated in the modern disciple. The abruptness of which the book of Acts closes is not accidental. It deliberately suggests that the thrilling narrative is unfinished and that the acts of God through the Spirit are to have their sequel through the Christian dispensation, each successive generation adding a chapter full of beauty and power to the one that preceded it. The apostolic time it was, I'm sorry, I skipped the, uh, the acts recorded in this remarkable book are in the truest sense the acts of the Spirit. For in apostolic times, it was the Holy Ghost who appeared as the counselor and helper of the Christian leaders. At Pentecost, the praying disciples were filled with the Spirit and preached the gospel with power. The seven men chosen as deacons were full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Acts 6.3. It was the Holy Spirit who led in the duration of Saul, I'm sorry, in the ordination of Saul. Acts 9.17. In the acceptance of Gentiles into Christian fellowship, Acts 10.44-47 in the separation of Barnabas and Saul for missionary work, Acts 13, two through four, and the council of Jerusalem, Acts 15, 28, and in Paul's missionary journeys, Acts 16, six through seven. Another time when the church suffered intensely at the hands of Roman and Jewish persecutors, it was the spirit who sustained the believers and kept them from error. If you would, because you have this handout in your own study, take the time and go over those uh, uh, chapters uh, because you will see where God's power, where his power comes from. And it was mentioned here. God's power comes from his Holy Spirit. What are we waiting for in this time period today? The farmer and the latter rain. Because to give us what? Power. So it said that the same things that happened to them would happen to us. So we need to have that power. We need to have God's Holy Spirit. And this is what we're waiting on. And God said, wait on him. And we will. Because it's in his time. You had a question. Um, I was going to make a comment. It's beautiful what you're saying and how true that is. And right now the Lord is bringing stuff up and out of us so that when the time comes, we'll be ready to receive that power. You can't get that power and you got junk. Right. It's still all embedded within us. Mm -hmm. You're right. You are so right. I have a few more of these if there's... Okay. Going further, and, and, and I want all of you to know that this is a Sabbath school, so your participation is needed. It's not only wanted, it's needed. And if you have text, if you have uh, proof text uh, to any of the things that we will be studying, feel free to share, to share them because this is a Sabbath school. Do I have good Bereans out there in the audience? Good Bereans. You know, everything that we're studying, you, if you don't know it, go back and see if it was so. Take down these uh, Bible verses because this is a Bible study. This is Sabbath school. Reading further from our uh, handout, chapter one, again, reading out of Acts of the Apostles. 
Acts uh, chapter 1, God's purpose for his church. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service, and his mission is to carry the gospel to the world. From the beginning, it, it has been God's plan that through his church shall be reflected to the world his fullness and his sufficiency. The members of the church, those whom he has called out of darkness into the marvelous light, are to show forth his glory. The church is the repository of the riches of the grace of Christ. And through the church, will eventually be made manifest even to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, the final and full display of the love of God. Ephesians 3.10. Yes. And speak loud, please. Yes. Because if we have not the experience, experience, we won't be able to proclaim the message. And as you see, the disciples, mm. they came in one court, they had that experience. They came, they loved each other, they desired to help mm. others, and God gave them that experience, the life experience. See, you can have proclaim the, the message, you can understand the word of God, but if we don't have the experience, the lifestyle to go with it, that's true you have to own it Christianity has to become yours because what is his glory Christ in us that's the hope of glory it's Christ in us that's how the the, the uh, Christians or the God's people will be like the sands of the sea because remember when he gave the uh, covenant to Moses, he spoke of one seed. But he also said that your, uh, your seed will be like the sands of the sea. So God's spirit has to be inside of us to be that number that will just fill the, the, the world, fill the earth, fill heaven with his glory. It's us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. We have to have him inside of us. That experience has to be our own because we are to be like him. Reading further. Many and wonderful are the promises recorded in the scriptures regarding the church. Mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people, Isaiah 56, 7. I will make them and the places around about my hill a blessing. And I will cause the showers to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessing. And I will raise up for them a plant of renown. And they shall be no more consumed with anger. I'm sorry, consumed with hunger in the land. Neither bear the shame of the heathen anymore. Thus shall they know that I, the Lord, their God, am with them. And that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God. And ye, my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord God. Ezekiel 34, 26, uh, 29 through 31. These uh, quotes are found in Acts of the Apostle, um, page 9 and Moving further, we'll go to page 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you, 
therefore ye are my witnesses. I am the Lord, have called thee. I'm sorry, I am, I the Lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold thy right hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Isaiah 43, 10 through 12, 42, 6 and 7. Again, Acts of the Apostle, 10, 1. In an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages, that they may say to the prisoners, go forth to them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed in the ways and their pastors, pastures shall be in all high places. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor the sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water shall he guide them. I will make all my mountains away, and my highways shall be exalted. Isaiah 49, 8 through 11, Acts of the Apostle 10, 2. Praise God for these words because these are your marching orders. This is what we are to be about. I'm reading from Matthews 13, 10 through 15. And the disciples came and said unto him, why speaketh thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they sing, see not, hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecies of Elias, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. At least at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should, listen to this, understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I shall heal them. What does God want to do? He wants to change our heart. He wants to change it. And that's what we need him to do is to change our heart. But look what he has given to you. He has given to you for this dispensation, his continued oracles in the everlasting gospel. We have the everlasting covenant in the Mosaic time. We have the everlasting gospel in this time. We hold the oracles of God. You possess the greatest story ever told and God want you to tell it because faith come by hearing and hearing the word of God so it's up to us we are his witnesses I looked up the word mystery in the Bible and I saw that it was mentioned 45 times in the Bible and there's mysteries but there's two mysteries that we concentrate on the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness those are your choices and that's what we 
as human beings, we have to face either accepting the mystery of iniquity or the mystery of godliness. When you think about it, where did sin start? It started in heaven. Lucifer, how? How? It's a mystery. How? He was in heaven. The top, the best. He was with God. He was a covering cherub. He held, he was the guardian of God's law. And that is what he is trying to destroy. How? Here we hold the oracles. Can those oracles save you? We learned that last week in our Sabbath school lesson. Um, not only Sabbath school, but our, our sermon. That you can have all of these truths, know these mysteries, know everything about God's word. Be able to teach it and preach it. But it, if it hasn't become a part of you, if you do not have Christ inside of you, that other mystery, the mystery of godliness, Christ in you, the hope of glory. If that other mystery is not inside of you, then we're lost. This is all for not. We have a lot of work to do as God's witnesses. Have any of you ever gone to court? Have you ever been a witness in a court? Think about it. You can either be for someone as a witness or against someone as a witness. And if you're God's witnesses, what are you supposed to be doing? Telling the truth. You have to tell the truth. Even in the court of law, they give, give you the Bible and they said the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Now think about that for a minute. There's two sides to a witness. Turn to Psalms 149. Psalms 149. I was getting ready for church this morning and God showed this to me and it was, it hit hard. It really hit hard. And I don't know if you will see it. I hope you will. Isaiah, I'm sorry, Psalms 149, verse 9. To execute upon them the judgment written, this, have, this honor have all his saints. Praise ye the Lord. Did you hear that? Judgment. When we're out witnessing to people, when we're telling them about God, there are those that will hear him and there will be those that will reject them. And as a witness, when you're given this honor to judge, you will know if they heard it or if they didn't. Think about it for a minute. Just think about it. God is giving you an honor because you are his witnesses. You go out, I hope, we go out and we teach, preach, and heal. And you know there's some that will hear it and there's some that will not. But when you have this honor to judge, you will have to tell the truth. And it can be a family member. It can be a loved one. You would have to tell the truth of what you know. Think about it. There's an awesome responsibility that we have as Christians. An awesome responsibility. And it is scary sometimes. But praise God that he will give us what we're studying today, that strength and the power to overcome these things. Because we must. We must. We must overcome. 
Let's get into our lesson. I just wanted to put those thoughts in your head as we study, because hopefully it'll start bringing things and making ties in the scriptures where you'll see things that you can tie in as we study. The first question relates to what we studied last week. Um, this is a review. It says, what is symbolized by the angel of Revelation 14, 6, 8, and 10? What is symbolized by the angel of Revelation 14, 6, 8, and 10? Could I have a reader? And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Verse 8, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And verse 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Every week, that is the affirmation of our faith. But put it together with what we had just read and what we had just talked about. What is symbolized by the angel is the question. If we studied last week, we would know the answer already because we already have gone through this. If you would turn to page six, excuse me, turn to page six, January 11th, and I think today is January 11th, so we're a week ahead of the lesson. The everlasting gospel. What is its what is it? It's power. This is what Brother Almeida went over last week. And the answer is right there on the first, on that page. It says, answer. The word angel signifies what? Speak up loud. We're in Sabbath school. Messenger. Angels are God's ministers or messengers and fellow servants with his people in the great plan of salvation. That's review. And if you don't have a copy of this lesson book uh, bef uh, for the end of our church services today, we can get one into your hands if, if you do not have one, because this lesson is very powerful. This is for our time, the everlasting gospel, the work that we are to be doing. Okay, question number two. And that is found in your handout also. These, the uh, uh, questions are found in your handout at the top of the page. You don't have one. There it is right there. The handout. It's found in your lesson and it's also found on the handout. What is the extent of the message? What is it called? What is the extent of the message and what is it called? Could I have a reader read Revelation 10, 11, and Revelation 14, 6? Revelation 10, 11. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy prophecy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And 14 what? Six. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them, to dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Okay, so what was the answers to that question? What is the extent of the message? You just read it. Prophesy again and to the extent and to what extent is the everlasting gospel? 
to the whole world. To the whole world. And that's what is being done. We've been seen, shown light that was hidden from us as Adventists. I've been an Adventist all my life. And these things are currently being brought out that I didn't know. And my brothers and my sisters that are in our conference churches, they don't see this. They don't hear this. This is what we are to be about is to prophesy again, which is, is happening. Because it's the everlasting gospel. It always was and always will be. It's not something new. It's everlasting. It's the same. Question. I was reading uh, the handouts we got last week. I was so moved with mm -hmm. that. And um, last Sunday morning, mm -hmm. I was reading it. I called my cousin, and she and I were excited. I said, okay, let's call my mom. So we did a three-way. I called my mom, and I started reading to her. My mother said, whoa, 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 wait, wait. And I said, can I finish? Can I finish? I have one more sentence. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And then she started drilling me. Well, well, who was that? Well, when was that? And, and I said, Lord, have mercy. Just like you said, they don't see it. See. And to tell you the truth, they don't really want to hear it. They say, oh, that was, th that was the Jew. And I'm saying, but you're missing the point of what it's saying. What did we read in Matthews? Oh. He speak to some in parables yes. because they don't see. If it's not happening to your heart, yeah. you won't see it. You won't understand it. And once it reaches your heart, what did he say he would do? He would heal you. Yeah. You would be converted and he would heal you. And you just said it. These things are happening, but also you are witness on both sides to the truth and to the condemnation. That's how solemn, that's how serious this is. And we have to be about his business. It's a serious yeah. business. Why do they weep and cry in the porch and the altar? Why? Because they understand what is happening. This is, God is coming. Yeah. And when he comes in his fullness, yeah. sin will not be able to withstand the brightness of his coming. Let's move on to three, to question three. The question is, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Could I have a reader read Romans 1.16? Could you speak loud for us, please? Romans 1.16. Could you repeat that? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Okay, so the question asks, what is the gospel? In a phrase, could I have someone give me a phrase of what the gospel is? We just read it. The power of God unto salvation. We want to be saved, right? Amen. Yeah. And it is this everlasting gospel because we must know the complete story because you can't be a true witness unless you know the complete story. And God has given us the past and he's giving us now. And we make the connection if we're in the present truth. We make the connection between I going to use this term, Judaism and Christianity. Most Christians forget about Judaism. Most Jews forget about Christianity. But the cross blended heaven to earth, Judaism, and Christianity. Because Christ is in the middle. It blended all of it together. All of it came through him. 
Now, as far as some of those oracles, we know that Christ became the lamb that was slain. It all led up to him. But how can you say you're a Christian when you forget about the past, the everlasting covenant, everlasting gospel? How can you make that disconnect and be a true Christian? You don't have the complete story unless you make that connection. And how can you proclaim it to the world if you do not make the connection? You, Seventh-day Adventists, are the only church, the only church that makes that connection. You have to be, uh, you have to be aware that there is a connection to be made. Yes. Otherwise. Well, once again, he speaks to them in parables because they don't want to see it. They're not letting it happen to the heart. You have to let it happen to the heart. This has to become a part of us. If it's not a part of us, are you going to die for it? If it's not a part of you, are you going to die for it? Because you may have to lay down your life for it. I mean, we had uh, the martyrs that would go singing while they were in the gallows, being burned. They're singing. Look at Stephen. You know, he saw God. You know, if it's not a part of us, it's not going to happen. It has to become a part of us. Or we're just playing. We're wasting our time. And this is the process we're, we're going through now. Yes. Because God, as you say, the power, it's given us the power to push forward, to learn more, to study more. Because you know it's the truth. Yes. You know it's the truth. It has become a part of you. And you, I mean, you, 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 you can't deny it. You've seen its power. You've seen its work through the past and through the present. I mean, as a young man, I was told various prophecies would happen. And me being a curious person, I wanted to see those things happen. Well, guess what? I have seen many of them happen. So I can't deny that it's the truth. I was foretold. And that's what prophecy is, isn't it? A foretelling. And once you're told and then you see it happen, how can you deny that that is the truth? You can't. But many do. Many do. They hear it, but they don't understand it. Last Sabbath, we studied, and that word came up then, the understanding. You have to have all of the components, all of the components for us to be made in the fullness of Christ. And we, at this end time, have a duty. I mean, a serious duty, because this is it. This is the last dispensation. Right. You say it again. You have the love, love for the truth. Right. Then you don't see the power you do have in that truth yes. to accomplish the goal God gave you for. Yes. Would you do us a favor and read the text that you just that you just went over? No, I can't do that. Yet. Okay. <laughs> Love of the truth. And I am also having difficulty myself, and I know it. <laughs> and I know it. God help us. Yes, yes, yes. Second Thessalonians. Yes. Second Thessalonians. Yes, Second Thessalonians 2. Oh. Reading from 9. Now just think of what he just said if you don't have a love for the truth. Look at what happens because of that. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders 
and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now listen. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Think about that. If you do not have this love for the truth, are you seeking it? Seriously, are you seeking it? If you don't have a love for truth, are you looking for truth? If you have a love for truth, you're going to look for it. And God tells us to search the scriptures. Matthew's 23. Proof texting. Right, patience, patience. So what God is trying to teach us, because how can we live with an infinite God for eternity mm -hmm. if we don't have patience on this earth for 70, 80 years of life? And wait on his promises. How can we receive the former mm -hmm. and the latter rain if we don't have the patience to do what is needed in this time period? I've come to the conclusion in my life that there is no other option. Yeah. Just like Peter said, Lord, where else can we go? You have the words of life. There's no place for us to go if we believe, and I believe. So I can't let him go. I can't. How can I let him go when I know he has the salvation in his hand? So no matter what happens, we have to hold on. Even if we don't see the promise. Hebrews 13, I mean, all of them, they did not see the promise in their life. But they held on to it because they know that it's true and it is in God's time. Not our time, it's in God's time. Joel chapter 1. Joel 1, we're proof texting, right? <laughs> Tested. Mm. Yeah. Yes. 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 Last Sabbath, I wish you gentlemen were here because we heard a sermon that cut very deep, and it was about the the fig tree, and it was entitled "Spare It This Year Also." There was a part in that lesson that really, really, really hit home in this heart. And I mean, all of it did, but this really hit home. And I want to read it. I don't know if, if some of you still have it, but it's the uh, last paragraph on the rear of the page. It says, if it bears fruit well, and if not, then after that, the heart that does not respond to divine agencies become hardened until it is no longer susceptible to the influence 
of the Holy Spirit. Then it is that the word is spoken, cut it down. Why cumbereth the ground? Today he invites you, O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. I will be as the dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. From me is the fruit found. Hosea 14, 1 through 8. Think about it. All of these things that we are learning, all of these oracles that God has given to us, if they're not changing us, if they're not having a altering influence on us as sinners, because that's what we are, he came to save us, if they're not turning us, changing us, what good is it? Why are we wasting our time? Well, I know this. I'm going to wait on the Lord. I'm going to hold on to him because there's no place else for me to go. Amen. I have to hold Amen. on to his promises Amen. because I can't go away from him. Yeah. I know it's the truth. You know too much, right? Yes, you're right. I know too much. <laughs> and I believe it. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is there is no place else for me to go. Yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, I'm messed up. But I'm going to wait on the Lord because I'm going to keep trying. I can't let him go. You can't. You have to hold on to him. Yeah, once you've tasted and see that it is good. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I hate the world. Yeah. Yes. Look what the world is doing to us. Look what it has done to us. No. I mean, what do you have when you're tied to this world? What? <laughs> Everything will be purified because nothing defileth will enter. Nothing. God is giving us this time and the time that we're living is is the day of atonement. And what happens during the time of atonement? You're to put away your sins. You're to consecrate yourself. You are to ask God to forgive you of every known sin and pray for those to brought, be brought to your remembrance that are unknown. So you can lay them at his feet. God is asking for our sins. You know, one day I was talking with my son and I was uh, just thinking prior to that how the only thing I can say I really truly own is my sin. And he said, you don't even own that because he bought it. He paid for it. And I was like, oh, my God, there's nothing that we have that doesn't belong to him. Nothing. Not even our sin. He bought them. We belong to him. He's our God. And he wants us back. He wants us back. He wants to share his life with us. He wants us to share our life with him. He's our father. And he's a good father. I know what he's done for me. I know what he has done for me. I know where he has brought me. And I don't want to go back. I don't. I want to go forward. And I'm sure many of you do too. Let's continue on our lesson. We're uh, looking at question four. And for those that have the handout and for those that do not have the handout but have the Sabbath school lesson, as we read lesson three, those same questions are found because they're review questions. So if you have them, we're just going over the review of last week. Why does man need the gospel? Why does man need the gospel? 
Could I have a reader read Romans 3.23 for me? Why do man need the gospel? 323, Romans 323. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. Could I have a reader to read 1 John 3, 4? Remember what he said, all have sinned. 1 John 3, 4? Yes. Whosoever committed sin transgressed also the law. Sin is the transgression of the law. Oh, but he did away with the law. <laughs> There's a biblical definition of sin right there. Transgression of the law. So then you realize you're contradicting. It makes no sense when you say the law has been done away with. Because it connects to Judaism. It goes back. And I'm a New Testament Christian. Question. So the logic would be, you know, if, if they would stop and see it, that if there's no law, there's no sin. But we just read what? All have sinned. All have sinned and come short. And that sin is the transgression of the law. Going further. Let's read Romans 7, 7. Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. How do we know what's wrong without a law? How would we know? would be in complete darkness, Brother Eddie, you're right. So it's okay for me to do this and to do that and claim to be a Christian. But God has just told us all have sinned and fall short and that sin is the transgression of the law. Without the law, how would I know what sin is? It's right here in his word. It is. The, 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 the law is or somebody is a witness and say, <laughs> you know, there's a piece of lettuce in your teeth. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. We have to make the complete connection between the everlasting gospel and the everlasting covenant. We have to make the complete connection. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same God. I'm going to paraphrase a quote I heard the other day or I read the other day that said, is he not the same God that spoke the law on Sinai and spoke the blessings on the Sermon of the Mount? Is he not the same God? It's not a different God. It's the same God. So how could he do away with the law? And speak the love of the law on the Mount of Blessings. It's the same, and it's all about the love. He's telling us, love God, love your fellow man in the law. Sermon on the Bound. Love, love. He's telling us what to do. We have to love. We have to be connected with his kingdom, which is all about love. I've made this statement here before, and I'm going to make it again. Would you want to save something you don't love? So if we don't love our fellow man, we don't care what happens to them. We're not about trying to save them. But God wants us to go do what? He came to save, and we're supposed to be like him, Christ in us, the hope of glory, to be about his work, saving souls. There's people out there that's ready to die. 
And Satan is having a big fun in the last, well, I mean, the 19th century was the bloodiest century the world has ever seen. And the 20th century, I'm sorry, the 20th century. And now we're, what, the 21st century now? And it's starting out to be the same. There's people laying down that will never have that opportunity. It's up to God. And Satan wants to see his, our brothers and our sisters perish. He loves war, loves it, because it brings out the worst in humankind. It brings out the worst in war, and he loves war. And uh, many of those souls that have never had that light, they're laying down in the dust. Or many of them that did have the light, did they respond to the light? Did they allow that light to change them? Did they hold on to his promises? God has seen fit for you and me to cross over into 2014. And I praise him for it. Personally, I never thought I would live to see this time. I didn't. And for me to be 60 years old at the end of last year, I never, never thought I would get to be 60 years old. Never did. Seriously, I didn't. I thought he would have come or, man, something would have happened to me by the time. You know, but here we are. Do we have to wait on him? Yes, because he's waiting on us to be about his business. You have a question? Question, answer, testimony. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So my first priority is to find out what this love is. Once I find that love out, then this love of the truth can grow. Then I can care about Eddie, Mildred, Susan, Jack. Because I'm thinking about before I accept you. I didn't care about nobody. Once that love came, then I realized I had the capacity through that love to love you. I don't even know you. Because you are in the family of God. God loves you. So therefore, God is in me. I have to love you. I can't just do you wrong. I just can't just throw you out with the bath water and fix that. I can't do any of that. I'll be disowning mm. my relationship, my own relationship right. with God. Amen. So it's important that I get this love of the truth which God gives me as I get connected with him. Mm -hmm. So I have to study. Yes. The answer is in the scriptures. It says God is love. Once we have that connection with God and we know what God requires of us to do justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly, that's what he requires of us. Once we start realizing that, you know, I, I heard it said we have to be humble. You know, we have to humble ourselves. You had a question? No, I'm just going to mention it. A comment? On, on what he was saying. Yes. Um, I think often, um, and I'm sure all of us do meet people every day, or we know people at work who are not easy, not easy to, to like, but not easy to love. Um, but just as you were saying, when we get that, as we allow the power of God to change us, then it allows us to start looking at people, to start see, seeing them as Christ sees them. Because when we see them as Christ sees them, mm -hmm. then we can look, we can look past what the, uh, um, we can look at, at not them as having done something wrong to us, but we can look at the true source, that is the enemy that's doing wrong to us. And that's why when Christ was standing before Annas and Caiaphas, when he was being slapped around, if I, if I remember correctly, Zyrage says that 
even Christ was tempted at that point to let, let his, his divinity shine through and lay him in the dust. But he was able to look past what they were doing to him and saw that it was the enemy that was doing it to them. So that's why it, it made it easy for him to love them and, 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 and just like he said on the cross, forgive them because they don't even know what they're doing. So as we allow the power of God to change us, then we start looking at our brother at, as Christ sees us. Yes. And, and then it makes sense because just to read, love your neighbor as yourself or love your enemies, and then you're thinking about what your enemies have done to you, you're like, wait a minute, that's totally impossible. How do you expect me to do that? But it's because we keep coming from the, the human standpoint, looking at them as having done the wrong to us. But Christ has, sees past that. And he sees it, he sees the source as, as an enemy. And that's why he, he, he's able to, he's able, and, and, and when we allow that, that then we are able, we're able to love the person because we let, we realize that it's another power. Is that living in the spirit or is that living in the flesh? See, that's the choices. And earlier, I don't know if all of you were here when we first started, but we talked about the two mysteries. The mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness. There's two powers that is vying for our souls. The mystery of iniquity or the mystery of godliness. And I think you're here today this Sabbath morning because you have chosen the mystery of godliness. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3. Verse, uh, starting in verse uh, 18. 318. It's where we are. And it says, Praise God. We see even right here that mm. even through life, God has to mold our character with different objects of life so we can truly, mm. because sometimes we don't even know that we're naked. Right. How, how, how can we know that we're naked? We don't even know that we're sinning sometimes. But truly, if God would just go back to the point of humbling us, then we would see our faults. And truly, God can give us his righteousness. Yes. What dispensation, what period of time, what church was he giving that message to? Laodicea. Now, when I was in many of our conference churches, it was almost a band of courage to be considered Laodicea. It's like, what? We're Laodicea. We knew it. We know it. We know we lay to see it. We know where we are in time because of the prophetic teachings that we have. We know where we are in time. But we also need to know what we must do. And you just read it. We have to do what God wants us to do. We have to get that eye sad. That gold tried in the fire and gold that is purified is tried how many times? Seven times before it is pure. Brother and sister, we're going to go through some trials and tribulation because he said all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will do what? Suffer persecution. Get ready. But wait and hold on to him because there is no place else for us to go. We have to hold on to him. this world is with 
were never in God, was never God's intention. Mm -hmm. His intention is to bring us back uh, 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 to, to, to the world that he initially intended. So I, you hear a lot of philosophers all the time when people ask, well, what is the, the purpose of life and all that? Well, according to the word of God, the only purpose of this life is to allow God to prepare you for the next, mm -hmm. period. So anything that comes to you in this life, if you look at it in those terms, bad or good, it all serves the same purpose. And that's it. So it, when you understand it, it makes no sense for us to even want to get comfortable here. You know, or, 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 or yeah. see how much we can accumulate that will be burned. Yeah, because your only purpose, from God's perspective, your only purpose in this life is to allow him to prepare you for the next. That's it. Because we lost our first estate. That's it. You know, he didn't intend for all of this to happen, but this was the plan because it did. But God created us to please him. And Jesus said, I always please your father. And that's what we're to do. I know when my kids please me, I am a happy dad. I'm a happy dad. You know, and I, you that have children, when your kids please you, you're happy. You're a happy dad. That's what God wants from us. But when they don't, do I still love them? Yes, I still love them. I may not like what they're doing, behavior. Are we brethren? We may not like what you're doing, but I'm supposed to love you. That's right. That's right. I had a question. I read this um, um, early, early writings, um, mm. and it was the chapter end of the 2300s. I saw the Father rise from the throne, and in a flaming chariot go into the Holy of Holies within the veil and sit down. Then Jesus rose up from the throne, and the most of those who were bowed down arose with him. I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitude mm. after he arose, and mm. they were left in perfect darkness. Those who arose when Jesus did fixed their eyes, wait, kept their eyes fixed on him as he left the throne and led them mm. out a little way. This was the part that got me. Mm. Then he raised his right arm, and he heard his lovely voice saying, Wait here, I'm going to my father to receive the kingdom. Keep your garments spotless, and in a little while I will return from the wedding and receive you to myself. Then a cloudy chariot with wheels like flaming fire surrounded by angels came to where Jesus was, and he stepped into the chariot and was born to the holiest where the father sat. Then this is the other part that got me. I turned to look at the company. This is the next um, chapter next uh, paragraph. I turned to look at the company who were still bowed before the throne. They did not know that Jesus had left it. Satan appeared to be by the throne, trying to carry on the work of God. I saw them look up to the throne and pray, Father, give us, the th um, give us thy spirit. Satan would then breathe upon them an unholy influence. Mm -hmm. In it there was light and much power but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. <coughs> God have mercy. Yes. God have mercy. Right there, you just saw the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness because that's what is vying for our souls. We're almost at the end of today's lesson. We haven't even got, gotten into it, but we are reviewing. And the last question, five in your handout, what does the gospel do for the sinner? What does the gospel do for the sinner? If I could have a reader read Galatians 3.13. Galatians 3.13. I said, redeem us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. 
Did he pay for? Did he buy our sins? Did Christ buy our sin? So we can't even claim our own sin. They belong to him. And he's asking us to give them to him so he can forgive them and blot them out. And he wants to give you power to confess your sins and he would give you righteousness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what he wants from us. So we need to really be praying about, Lord, forgive me. I mean daily. Daily do you ask God when you pray that for him to forgive you. I mean, that's kind of the least thing we can do because, you know, we were not 100% that day. No. Yeah. He's writing everything down and he has to investigate. Yeah. If we really mean it, our pattern. Yeah. Yeah. There's angels that are recording everything we do. And as the spirit of prophecy says, with terrible exactness. Wow. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Also read Romans 1.16 again. Romans 1.16. Could I have a reader, please? He's covering everybody. To the Jew first. Why to the Jew first? Because would we even know of these things without what he did to them and for them and through them? Unfortunately, just like us, they failed at their mission. We haven't failed. Are we failing? We don't want to fail at God's mission for us because this is it. This is the last of it. This is the last time. And we know that because of our studies with the spirit of, uh, through the spirit of prophecy and, and we know what we are in the scheme of things, that God is judging the living now. That's us. And where does judgment begin? The house of God. We don't know. But do you give up? No. You hold on. Yeah. Don't give up. Hold on. Hold on, because guess what? You really don't know. Ah, to come too far to turn back now. No. Don't give up. Hold on. He wants you to wait on him, because if you wait on him, it does kind of make it seem like you believe him. You hold on to it, you know. So you want to hold on to God's promises. You want to pray his promises. You want those promises to become part of your life. Because how else did the martyrs hold on while they were being killed? How? John the Baptist, uh, I mean, we can just go on through all of our apostles and disciples, the things that they held on to. You know, uh, if you have an opportunity, uh, again, read Hebrews 13, the, the champions and heroes of faith. What they endured, because all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And this is part of our duty. But God will be with us. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Mm-hmm. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Praise God. Praise God. 
Do we believe it? Do we believe it? Do we hold on to it? We have to. We have to hold on to it. Where is our hope? Can we have hope in riches? Can we have hope in power? Can we have hope in understanding and knowledge and all this? No. The only hope is Jesus. He is the only hope. And we must hold on to him. No matter what happens in our lives, you hold on to God. You never let him go. Because once you give up, you've lost. And that explains being peculiar. Yes. And that's real. You will become peculiar when you hold on. Because look how the world is turning. I mean, just think how rapidly the acceptance of homosexual marriages have happened to not only this country, but the world. These things are happening rapidly, and the spirit of prophecy again said that these things will be, there will be rapid events. And we're watching these events happen rapidly. But, you know, I, I, I think on that, and I think there was two institutions before sin entered the world. Marriage was one, and the Sabbath was the other. We're knocking down marriage. What is left? This is what we're, we're knowing the mark of the beast, the king of the north is coming. So once that law, once that thing is knocked down, the marriage, it's accepted where they, it's gone. Then they can concentrate on the Sabbath. We're in this time period. This is ending. Yes. Wow, I never heard of this. And that was the, um, mm. It was actually, it was the he goat. Are you kidding? And had the, it was on the news. It was last week, and I was amazed. I wasn't really amazed. Mm. I wasn't surprised. But how they, and the, how they portrayed it, let the children come and sit on his lap and had children around, and they're purposely going to um, do this across from the Ten Commandments. I said, hold mm. on. Keep your hands in, in keep your seat belts, because you're getting ready to take off on a wild ride. Yes. We got to know who we know and what we know. That's right. Stand for it. That's right. Yep. He gave unto you to know the mysteries. I, said, I told you. <laughs> and now that you see these things happen, do you believe them? You know, it should strengthen your belief as you see prophecy unfulfilled. When you see prophecy fulfilled, it should strengthen your faith. And again, that uh, part of uh, Pastor's sermon last week, that if this is not changing us, if we're, uh, it's going to make our hearts harden, if the Holy Spirit, I mean, what else can the Holy Spirit do? What else can he do if it's not changing us? He's done everything. This word must change us. In the earlier part of our, our Sabbath school lesson, it was, it was brought out that, you know, it has to become a part of you. It has to be something that you are a part of. You have to be experienced. That's the word. You have to experience this for yourself. So you can't share something you're really not experiencing because it's just words off a page. You had a, a question, and we're just about out of time. Mm -hmm. And we see these signs, and we recognize the signs, and we study God's word. That should strengthen us mm -hmm. in our choice that we have made. Amen. Amen. So as you get strengthened in that choice, then you want to live continually in that choice. Right. And I like to say this to Michelle. <laughs> I tell my son all the time, God is bigger than our circumstances. Amen. 
Amen. Wherever you find yourself, God is bigger than Amen. that. <laughs> Wherever you find mm -hmm. yourself. So in that knowledge itself, strengthening, making fall in love with God, no matter what, he got an answer. Mm -hmm. He got a way. That's right. Whatever circumstance. That's true. And when he finds a saint, when he finds one of his servants living like that, it pleases him. It pleases him. Okay. Um, this was just the beginning of the lesson study, and that basically it was a review from last week. So next week we will actually get into the lesson. And I encourage each of you to take the lesson and study it during the week so when you come you will have something to share with your brethren because this is a Sabbath school. We use the proof tech method where if you find other scriptures or comments or, or um, what am I trying to say, quotes from the spirit of prophecy, bring them. Bring them. This is a Sabbath school, and I like your participation in it. It makes it interesting, and today I think was very interesting. And a while back, my son, I asked him, I said, how do you learn all those things? How do you know those things? <laughs> he said, Dad, when you start teaching those things, you taught yourself. And it's true. Once you start teaching Sabbath school, you have to go over the lesson. So you're being taught yourself. So I encourage each of you to become involved as a teacher because you're going to have to learn it if you're gonna share it with somebody. And once it becomes a part of you, God start healing you. So let it become a part of you because we don't want to just be entertained. I don't think any of us came to church to be entertained. We come to church to learn, but we also come to church to share. One more question and we're already a few minutes over, Pastor. Sorry. Based on your statement, you are a teacher. Mm -hmm. Amen. You cannot, you follow the vine, so you have to produce. You may not be actively going out there plucking the fruit off, but you are producing the apple, the orange, whatever it is. And that goes back to, again, the sermon last week. Yes. We were spared this year also. Yes. 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 This year also, we were spared. This year also. We don't want to be counted as something that's cumbereth the ground. Um, I, I just wanted to read a text to uh, mm -hmm. like back up what you were saying about God. And this will be the last one, folks. So we'll save Everybody for next week. God is bigger than that. And, you know, mm -hmm. this, I don't know. I just came across this text this past week when I was in my Bible study. And it, it just it just made me so happy. Speak it and speak loud, please, yeah. so we can all hear it. Coming to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. Able, yes. <coughs> Make a way of escape. Amen. 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 That's a promise. That's a promise. Hold on to it. God is able. If you'll bow your heads with me. Again, Father, we thank you for showing up. We thank you for allowing your Holy Spirit, Lord, to enter into this premise, this, this place. We thank you, Lord, for opening our hearts so that we can hear and understand and to know. We thank you, Lord, for your word. 
We thank you, Lord, for your promises. We thank you for your prophecies. We thank you, Lord, for every aspect of you. Because, Lord, you are greatly to be praised. And we love you, Lord. But the only way we can prove it is through obedience. So we're asking you, Lord, please, please, Lord, please take these earthen vessels, Lord. Recreate them into something you can use for the glory of your name. Lord, we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our God, our King. Amen.